People cheat all the time. It's a sad element of our society and it's something that causes a lot of people a great deal of pain, whereas others, they don't really mind it so much. I mean, they might mind the social fallout, but for them, they're not possessive in that way. They don't need it to just be them. They really don't mind. But what do you do if you are someone who minds? What do you do if you're somebody who's built your life with someone? You've married someone, you've had children together, and then somebody betrays you in this way that just absolutely guts you. Twitter and TikTok alike have been debating for years, what is the appropriate response when someone cheats? Do you put glitter in their car? Do you punch them in the face? Do you leave with grace and dignity so that they always think back on you like, wow, she was such a class act, I shouldn't have lost her. Or do you get a little bit more extreme than that? Maybe key their car, show up to their job, embarrass them online, dox them. Where do we draw the line? And it seems that most reasonable people can agree that the line moves within the realm of reason. If you've been dating for a month, maybe don't key that guy's car, just dump him, he sucks. And if you've been married to her for 15 years and she's sleeping with your brother, yeah, Take everything that you can, but it's not uncommon for people to say flippantly to their spouses or their partners, if you ever cheated on me, I'd kill you. Hey guys, and welcome back to another Spooky Saturday. Okay. A couple updates. One, I know I'm not wearing a black wig, it's just my hair, but I have to wash my wigs. They have gotten so ratty. Like, it's just, <laughs> I have to do it. And I'm going out of town for two weeks, so I'm filming two spooky Saturdays in one day, so it's just gonna be brown hair for these next two episodes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm gonna be changing all of the names in this case. A lot of the names are anonymous still, so I feel like since there's only one or two names that have been publicly available, I might as well just make them all up. Katrina was having fun. She was out with her husband, they were partying, they were drinking, they were making new friends, and they've been doing this for the last couple of months. They loved where they lived. Somewhere along the way, they became friends with this girl, Lily. Lily was a bit younger than them, but whoever said that all your friends have to be your same age? I mean, I personally have friends of all different ages. Some of my best friends are in their 40s. I'm only in my 20s. I don't have friends who are teenagers, obviously, that's where I draw the line, but I even have friends who are like 70 years old. So I totally get where Lily was coming from. It doesn't matter if somebody's a couple decades older than you, why not be friends with them? Especially when they're a sweet, fun couple. At least, that's what she told herself. And that's what she told her friends. And that's also what she told Katrina. Whenever she asked, like, if it was weird being friends with people so much older than you. But really the real reason Lily wanted to be friends with Katrina and Amadeus was because she was interested in them as not just a friend. She wanted to see if they could potentially take things to the next level. And she started slowly hinting at this. And well, you know, once Amadeus found out, he was down. He was super down. A 25 year old wants to bang me and my wife. This is like every married guy's dream. And Katrina, she was like, you know what? I like Lily and I've never done anything like that. So why not? Let's just give it a try. It's nice to try new things. And so they did. They had a tres way. And after Amadeus was hooked, he came out of that experience like, this is me now. Katrina, you and me, we're just gonna be banging Lily and honestly anybody else who wants to for the rest of our lives. That was awesome. Katrina didn't really feel that way. It was consensual. She didn't, she didn't change her mind halfway through the experience or anything like that. She didn't have any remorse or regrets. It was just one of those things where she was like, you know, I tried it, but it wasn't for me. I don't really wanna do that again. And since they were a married couple, obviously, 
if one of them doesn't want to have a tres way, they can't move forward with that. You know? They're partners. Amadeus didn't love that. He had a really good time with Lily and he wasn't willing to give that up, not even for his wife. And so when eventually a couple months later, Katrina and Amadeus and their five children ended up moving to Maryland, he kept in contact with Lily. Katrina was a little annoyed by this, not jealous, but she was just sort of like, hey, like I set a boundary, I'm just feeling like ignored, you know, like what? And it was only a matter of time before Amadeus didn't ask, but told Katrina that Lily would also be moving to Maryland. And luckily, since they had a basement apartment available, she would be moving into their house. Katrina didn't want her in their house. They have five kids, they're a family of seven. Eight people are gonna be in this house now? And Katrina was a housewife, so all of the domestic labor would be falling on her shoulders. And of course, you know, Lily would be expected to take care of her space in the basement apartment, but still, she wasn't comfortable with that. But Amadeus wasn't having a conversation with her so much as just letting her know. Lily moved in and the children took it well. They didn't really read into it initially. And Amadeus was really close with his oldest daughter, Violet. After Lily moved in, he and Violet, they were still thick as thieves. So he at least felt like this is working. And while he still spent most nights sleeping upstairs in his bedroom with his wife, he spent a lot of nights in the basement apartment hanging out with Lily. And it became abundantly clear that they were in a relationship. And Katrina was confused by this because she was like, okay, so you're just cheating on me now and you've moved the other woman into our house? <laughs> why, don't, why don't you guys just officially get together? Why don't we just break up and then you guys move out? I mean, it just seems like if you don't want to be married to me, like whatever, you know? Like I can deal with that, but why bring it into my house? Like, j just go get your own place. Amadeus's response was nowhere near as level-headed. He was straight up like, if you don't like it, you can get the f out. Katrina felt like she was being pretty cool about this whole thing and Amadeus had put her in a really difficult situation. You know, she's not gonna get out. She's got five kids. She's not gonna leave her five kids. And again, she's the housewife here. Plus on top of that, Amadeus had recently gone through a series of spinal surgeries. And I've had spinal surgery, by the way, I have 28 screws in my back, two steel rods. It is the most physically invasive surgery that you can have beyond neurosurgery. And the recovery time online, it's like, oh, it'll be two weeks. For me, it was over a year. So it is entirely, possible that he truly was unable to work, especially since he had had multiple spinal surgeries in pretty quick succession. But yeah, Katrina wasn't gonna leave her five children even though Amadeus was home all day, you know? She was the one holding this house together. At least like that's what she told herself. The reality was that the house was an absolute mess. Some people are disorganized, you know, as long as your house is clean, as in there's not like black mold growing places, a certain level of disorganization is really a person by person thing. And it's not inherently an issue, but I would say that their house is on the more extreme end of that spectrum. It was really very, very, very messy. It's not entering like a hoarder territory, but it was extremely cluttered. And I would probably find being in that house to be pretty uncomfortable for me, let alone living in it. I don't think I could do that. I think that would drive me absolutely insane. But hey, they sh they're a family of seven, and then there's an eighth person living in this house now. So it might not have always been like that. And if you think like, wow, this is like a terrible situation for Katrina, things can't get worse, they did. They absolutely did get worse. Because one morning, she dropped her kids off at school like she did pretty much every day, but one of her children was sick. So she was like, all right, my oldest daughter, my 13 year old, Violet, she's gonna stay home from school. I'm gonna go take her to the doctors. So after she dropped off the other four children, she took Violet to the doctors and they went to the grocery store and they just had a sort of normal 
mother-daughter you're sick out of school day. And when they came back to the house, Lily was just blasting music in the basement, heavy metal, super loud, so they were like, whatever. Violet went to her room to go lie down because, again, she is sick. And Katrina decided that she was gonna do the same because she assumed Amadeus is probably downstairs in the basement. So she went up the stairs, walked down the hall, and as she's entering her bedroom, she sees it. Amadeus is lying on the bed with a gun in his hand and a bullet wound in his temple. She doesn't turn on the lights, but she can still see enough to know. And so she immediately calls 911. Anaheima County 911. I just spent the day taking kids to the dentist and then going grocery shopping. I'm supposed to be leaving to take my husband to a doctor's appointment right now, but he's not responding at all and he's got his gun laying next to him in the bed. Do you think he shot himself? I don't know. I didn't turn the lights on in the room. Before she even gets off the phone, officers arrive at her house and they immediately get to work. They look at Amadeus and they're like, dang, okay, his face is burnt. The gun was clearly right up against his head. You know, this is, this is a clear cut suicide. Is there anyone else in the house? And Katrina lets them know like, yes, her daughter Violet is home sick from school. So she's off in her room. And there is a woman who lives in the basement apartment named Lily as well. But she hasn't talked to her today, but she's definitely down there. I mean, she's blasting music all morning. And the cops hear this, they're like, okay, yeah. And the music is still going. So they're thinking to themselves, okay, it's very possible that she has literally no idea that someone's even dead upstairs because of how loud this music is. So they head downstairs to check out the basement apartment. And when they get down there, they realize this basement apartment is somehow even messier than the rest of the house. The music is so loud. It's creating this really eerie situation where the officers were very uncomfortable as they were scanning through the area. And as they walked further in, they saw a scene straight out of a horror movie. Blood is all over the walls, all over the apartment, soaking into the mattress. It's clear that no one could possibly survive this. And when they finally approach Lily's body, it's clear that she's riddled with stab wounds. And just based on the sheer amount of blood, the distance at which the blood has gone, it's obvious that somebody actively murdered this woman and she fought for her life. And also because of the concentration of blood and the pattern of the blood, they quickly concluded that this stabbing must have happened when Lily was asleep and she woke up mid stabbing and then began defending herself. Katrina being the only adult in the home, you know, it's obvious that she has to come in for questioning. They start asking her about her life, her relationship, her husband. She explains that ever since he had those spinal surgeries, he has been really depressed. She's very transparent about the fact that he was absolutely sleeping with the woman downstairs, Lily. She's very transparent about the fact that the relationship began from a threesome. Police ask like, okay, but are you, how could you not be jealous? I mean, you know, this currently looks like a murder-suicide, but it could be a double murder and if your husband was sleeping with somebody else in your own home, that's absolutely a motive. But Katrina brushed this off really quickly. She was like, no, like, I've known about this for a long time. It wasn't something that surprised me. I knew before she moved into my house. Like, I obviously don't like the arrangement, but I wasn't just going to leave my children. And I was over Amadeus. Like, our relationship emotionally died, like, a long time ago and all of this just was the final nail in the coffin. But no, I didn't kill my husband. I didn't kill the woman downstairs. I'm not sure what happened, but it wasn't me. She answers every question. She volunteers her cell phone. She agrees to a polygraph and she's basically doing literally everything that an innocent person would do to prove their innocence. And this leaves the police feeling very confident that this really is a murder-suicide, you know? It seems like everything is pointing to that, and there's just, 
there's just not a lot of conspiracy here. There's just not a lot of questions, but they do still have to do their due diligence and they are still collecting evidence from the home, but it's taking a little longer than usual purely because the home is so cluttered and so messy. A little bit of time goes by and while they're gathering evidence, they find not a smoking gun, but a very key bullet casing. Now this bullet casing, it doesn't match the gun that Amadeus had in his hand on the bed. And it was in the bedroom, off side of the bed, a couple inches away from a Bible. And so this would likely be the bullet casing from the bullet in his head. So they go and they retrieve the bullet from his head and conclude, yep, that bullet and this bullet casing go together, but the gun does not. So he wasn't shot with this gun and therefore he didn't shoot himself. There had to have been some sort of miscommunication or confusion that led someone to place the wrong weapon in his hand when framing this suicide. But that's not all that they found. In Lily's basement apartment, which is even more cluttered, it took them a while, but they eventually found a very key piece of evidence. That being a pregnancy test, a positive pregnancy test. But again, Katrina didn't care about this relationship. She didn't care if they moved on without her. The thing is, Katrina hadn't actually painted the full picture to the police. And that would become abundantly clear when they received the results for her polygraph, which she didn't just fail, she absolutely tanked. She was dishonest on every single question to such an extreme degree that even though polygraphs are municipal in court, anyone looking at that would be like, whoa, this person could not have been telling anything even close to the truth. Cause mind you, when she was answering the questions, she seemed cool, calm and collected outside. It didn't seem like she was anxious and that that would affect the results. So the police saw that and they were like, wow, that's pretty damning. And they brought her back in for questioning and they let her know just how severely she had failed that polygraph. And her answer was just, oh, wow, that's crazy. I don't, I don't know why I would fail it. Maybe I was more nervous than I thought, but they don't stop there. They also inform her that her hands her clothes and her phone all tested positive for gunpowder. Katrina's like, wow, I really, I don't know what to say. That is so weird. I don't know like how that could have happened. Hmm. The police are not buying it. They're like, uh, we know how that could have happened. And so at this point in time, it seems really, really clear that Katrina was jealous of her husband moving the other woman into their house and then he got her pregnant and then she killed them. And you know, for a lot of people, that would be a compelling motive. Not normal people. Normal people do not kill their spouses when they do them wrong, they just break up. But it would be honest to say that people haven't killed over affairs. Of course they have, it happens all of the time. That's a classic case of a crime of passion. But this isn't just a case where Katrina felt betrayed. This is a case where her daughter, Violet, also felt betrayed. See, she was like the golden child with her dad. She was the favorite kid. And when there's five kids, that goes a long way. And all the kids love their dad. All of them love their dad. Katrina said otherwise. Katrina said that he was incredibly abusive, both physically and mentally and emotionally. But the police have a hard time knowing just how much of that is true, purely because the children were so positive about their father. Now, brief disclaimer, you can be a terrible partner and a good parent. So that's not really any evidence that there wasn't abuse here. So how did he betray Violet then? Like, what did he do? Well, he used to confide in Violet about everything 
they were that kind of father-daughter relationship where he would tell her all of his secrets and she would tell him all of her secrets and they just told each other everything. So when Violet walked past the basement apartment door and she heard Amadeus and Lily talking about how they want to have another baby, how they're so excited to have another baby, their baby. Violet was upset. It triggered a violent and jealous rage in her. And from that moment forward, she began planning. She began planning with her mother. See, Violet and Katrina, they didn't want blood on their hands, but they did want Amadeus and Lily dead. And you really wouldn't think so just because when Violet was questioned by the police, she was incredibly emotional. She was hysterical. She was absolutely gutted over the death of her father. She even tried to run out of the police station multiple times. They had a very difficult time getting through questioning with Violet. So she seemed to be react the way a lot of 13 year olds would react had their father just killed themselves. When the reality was that Katrina and Violet had been conspiring. And since they didn't want blood on either of their hands, they decided that they should talk to Violet's boyfriend, Carl. Carl was a few years older than Violet and he had a really, really, really bad family situation. He essentially had nowhere that felt like home. He was one of those forgotten kids. And Katrina knew that as well as anyone. And so she began filling him with stories about how Amadeus was abusing her, abusing her children. What a terrible situation it was. And she eventually got to a point where she said that she just wanted him dead. That she would do anything for him to die. That, <laughs> hell, if, if you went out and killed him, Carl, I would literally let you live in my house and become a part of my family. Carl was a kid who didn't really have a family. So the potential for him to not only be a hero, to save the girl that he's dating, to, to save her mom, and then get sort of pseudo adopted into a new family, that was pretty motivating for him. Yeah, he agreed to do it. So when the night came where it was all supposed to happen, he hid outside in the bushes until everyone was asleep. Then when it was time, Katrina signaled him to come inside the house and she handed him the gun. He went upstairs and he shot Amadeus in the temple first. Then he went downstairs into the basement apartment where a pregnant Lily was sleeping and he stabbed her while she was asleep. But she woke up and she began fighting him off. It was the fight of her life. He had a very difficult time killing her, but he did eventually succeed. The police were tipped off to Carl's involvement because they went through Violet's phone and there was a lot of correspondence, nothing that was concrete enough, but there was enough things to give them pause to question Carl. In addition to a 10 minute long phone call between Katrina and Violet, that would have taken place mere minutes after the murders. So the cops decided to bring Carl in for questioning. And when they brought Carl in for questioning, he immediately caved, he immediately caved. He wasn't, a killer by nature. He, he told them right away how bad he had felt, how ever since it happened, he just realized like this is going to affect other people, uh, you know, and he thought that he would feel like a hero and how he actually felt was like he was a monster and he didn't want anything to do with it. He didn't want to cover it up. He felt like he deserved the consequences of his actions. So he was as compliant as possible with the police. He told them about everyone's involvement, everyone's. And so when this case went to court, Katrina was given 60 years, Carl was given two life sentences, 
And Violet, because she was so young, was put into a juvenile detention center, but will eventually be re-released back into society. To me, this case is really interesting because there's so many what ifs. You know, would things have been different if Amadeus just divorced his wife and he didn't move Lily into their home? What if Lily hadn't gotten pregnant? What if Violet hadn't overheard the pregnancy and gotten jealous at the prospect of there being a new child with someone that her dad actually loves? What if Carl had come from a stable family situation? It just seems like a case where it could have so easily not happened so many different times, and yet this, there's this sort of syzygy where things just aligned in the worst timeline possible to create an absolutely horrific situation. And again, cheating is really bad. You shouldn't cheat on your partners. It's not an acceptable thing to do. You shouldn't stab anyone in the back because it's about having bare minimum respect for the people around you. And if you want to break up with someone, you should just be honest and you should just break up with them out of respect from human to human and the fact that you once had feelings for them. And then you can move on right away if you want, which is a little scummy, but hey, you're not cheating on someone. That being said, no one deserves to get murdered in cold blood, whether they cheated or not. If you guys made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I hope that you guys have been watching my podcast. Episode three just came out today with Jessica Burbank, one of my best friends. Episode one is Neil deGrasse Tyson. Episode two is Chubby Emu. I'm telling you, it's good, I promise. Please check it out. And I'm gonna have my dear friend John Green onto the podcast very, very soon. In fact, the reason why I'm having to film these shorter videos this week is because I am flying out to LA because his new movie, Turtles All the Way Down, is coming out and I get to go to the premiere and I'm very excited. I have a really cute dress. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. If you haven't liked by now and you liked the video, why not like it literally? And if you haven't subscribed, I would appreciate that too because it really, really does help me. Thanks. Bye.